When I get this spot open, I'm thinking like my grand opening about to be crazy. I think it was two people at my grand opening. <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, like if you're chasing something, you're going to have moments where like you got to be the only one clapping. You got to be the only yeah. one soiling yeah. your, your own flowers. So at that time, I'm soiling myself and not knowing that if I keep fighting, something is on the other side going to come. Welcome to Vault Empowers Talk. So we don't just scratch the surface. We dive deep into the lives of some of the world's most influential change makers. And today is no different. But before I introduce my guest of the day, I need you to go ahead and do me a favor. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button so you do not miss a daily dose of inspiration and motivation. But without further ado, I, Brandy Harvey, have the pleasure of sitting down with this amazing man sitting next to me. Derek Hayes is an entrepreneur, family man, and philanthropist. As the founder of Big Dave's Cheesesteaks, Derek has created a multi-million dollar business and one of the top 10 sandwiches in the world by the World Food Champions. Honored by Forbes in 2021 as the one next to watch, Derek continues to let the work speak for itself. With eight locations and three standing strong in Atlanta's Mercedes-Benz Stadium, Derek's goal is to grow exponentially into 100 locations worldwide. Derek's story of rags to riches proves that hard work, perseverance, and passion is the key to building more than an empire, but a legacy. Vault Empowers Talks welcome husband, father, franchiser, and philanthropist Derek Hayes to the show. Man, that was good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm over here like, man, I did all that. No, I appreciate you for having me. That was a that was probably one of the best intros. You dropped the mic on that. Hey, Amen. That's all Thank I got to do. We can just cut it right now. Hey, we can cut it. Listen, I am so excited to talk to you. I told you I was putting them notes down. No, I mean, you know, when I walked in here and I seen, you know, how much you knew about me, I just was inspired because, you know, having someone... Uh, like you, if you're a high, high quality person, I, I'm gonna call you a high quality woman. Amen. Not nah, for real, because you know, like where I come from, I'm showing kids that if you just work hard at something, you can get opportunities. And right now, I'm sitting here doing this interview with you, Steve Harvey, daughter, somebody <laughs> that I literally watched on TV my whole life, getting inspired yeah. by your father. And now I'm sitting here talking to the blessing he has brought to the world. So that's great. Oh my God, Derek, yeah. thank you. I mean, your story, I, I told you before we got on camera that most people, they know the glory of yeah. people, but they don't know the story. Yeah. And you are one of those stories as I researched you. I mean, you grew up in Philadelphia, moved here, but you are not, like, I, I mean, tragedy has been knocking at your door all every step of the way. Um, losing your father was really the catalyst for you starting yes. this business. Yes. Um, you know, it, it has been because, you know, growing up, you know, I tell people all the time, like, I came from a two-parent household. So I knew what it was like to have a mother and a father. But as I was growing up, my mother and my father, they took a break. But mm. before they took that break... I got to see what a father was like. You know, every day I was with my dad, um, whether we was fishing or he loved drag racing, but I never knew why he always wanted to keep me out the streets. You know, he would always be like, oh, you coming with me, like pool, stuff like that, you know? So I, early at an early age, I was always, you know, busy and staying stagnant with him. Yeah. So it made me who I am right now. So sometimes in life, you don't realize that when somebody is hard on you or when somebody is distracting you from things that you want to do, that's gearing you up to be who you are supposed to be for later on. And now I look at all of the, the principles and the morals, the way I carry myself. I got five kids now. I wouldn't know how to be a father to those five kids if I may have not seen the representation of yeah, my father. So yeah. that's my blessing. And losing him, that's a whole nother story because you got a father, a friend, you know, uh, a role model all of these things that you look at and then that person is no longer there. But the one thing that I wanted to do for my father, before he passed away, he told me that he wanted me to break my generational curses. He raised me to stand on my 10 toes and he wanted me to be that guy he know I was, who he raised. So I take these words with me every single day. So it's like moments where I was tired, I'm exhausted, I don't know how I'ma figure things out or I don't have the relationships to be able to scale the brand. I didn't quit. You know, coming from yeah. Philly, we got that Rocky mentality. You can beat me up. You can sit me down. Yeah. But as long as I still got breath in my body, yeah. I'm going to still pray to God. I'm going to still work hard. And I'm going to still find a way to get to that next step. And that's what I've been doing along the way. I call it the ugly truth. 
it's the ugly truth because yeah. 2009 is when your father yes. passed away. And and when we talk about loss and grief, what people don't understand is that you tell it that your your father, your uncle, yeah. your aunt, they all passed around the same time. Yeah, and it was crazy because like so my grandmother, um, and I want to say shout out to my grandmother. She one of the strongest women. Who I've you ever still met. take care of? Yes, yeah. ninety years old. Yeah, um, she's in my house right now. She got my <laughs> newborn son in her hands. Let me tell you what's the blessing of that though. What's the blessing of that is how the, how things recycle. Because when I was when I was probably about like five or six years old, I can remember moments where her mother spent mm -hmm. time with me, my great grandmother. Yeah, you know my grandma Cover. So like now I'm looking at my grandmother spend time. With my grand, I mean, with my kids, that's her great grands. Yeah. So it's like a recycling moment. But what's so special about it is, my grandmother's ninety years old. She still can wash clothes. <laughs> she still can fold clothes. Yeah. I try to keep her off the stove though, because she still <laughs> thinks she can cook. But the thing of that is, I promised her when, when you know, after my father died, my aunt died, and my uncle died. But when my grandfather died, I seen a piece of her kind of like, kind of like disappear. Yeah. Um, and that's because that's our life partner. That's like, you know, they had over 60 years in a relationship wow. being married and then you don't have your best friend. Sometimes that person in the morning who you used to arguing with in the kitchen or y'all y'all got little jokes, all of that changed. So I wanted to keep her happy. And before mm -hmm. my grandfather died, he was he was in hospice at home and he told me, he said, I was doing real. I wasn't doing good in business um, at the time. Dates Philly Water Ice. I, I was struggling in it. Nobody knew what the cheese. I mean, the Water Ice was. I didn't have cheese sticks at the time. But my grandfather told me. He said, "Listen, you're gonna be okay." I was in. I was in debt. I didn't know how I was gonna get out of it. But let me tell you, the one advice he gave me was when I brought the cheese sticks in there. He gave me a, a water, a oil ratio to put in the <laughs> bottle, and that was my secret a long time. Is just learning how to make the steak still stay moist yeah. and all of that. So the little things kept me going and keep me where I'm at right now. But the blessing behind that was me actually keeping my word. Yeah. Because let me tell you, we could say what we're going to do yeah. and how we're going to do it, but I kept my word. And when my grandfather passed away, I told my grandmother, I said, listen, your heart may hurt, but I'm going to take your pain away from you. Mm -hmm. I said, every single day, I'm going to bust my tail to be a better me so that you can see that you still got family, you still have a grandson that loves you, and you always got me to have your back. And now she's 90 years old. She got to see me cut every single ribbon on every grand wow. opening, wow. everything that I have. She'll see me on TV sometimes and be like, I'll come in the kitchen in the house and I'll be like, you okay? She'll just, she'll just be like, I just seen you on the news or I seen you do an interview. And like, those are the things that just make me proud of myself because yeah. I kept my word. Yeah. And keeping your word yeah. is so important. Yeah. Yeah. Keeping your word though in all the adversity, right? Because after your father passed away, you had your own accident. Yeah. And, you know, you that suffered a, a serious back injury that took you through four surgeries, right? Yeah, well, five. five actually, almost six because... So I'm going to actually take you through this. Um, so I got hurt in 2009. I had a, a, a really bad accident where I had a personal injury. Right. And I wound up... Um, it's called the sciatic nerve. I wound up uh, pinching that nerve really bad. Um, took me through six years of uh, a downslope of a roller coaster. You yeah. know, we got the roller coaster. I was in a downslope of it. I just had lost my father. Yeah. Um, a couple months prior, and then I'm now getting my life back together. I'm working at a hospital, and then the night of the Super Bowl, I get hurt. Philly had a, a really bad snowstorm, but needless to say, I'm now at this point now, and I'm like. God, what is going on with me? Yeah. I lose my father, yeah. and now I'm disabled. I don't know which way to go. I'm already was like kind of like in a depressed um, situation because I wasn't happy with my life personally, where I was at in my professional life. I wanted more of myself. I felt like I was letting myself down, um, and not to not to even shade anybody who has a job who who goes to work every day proudly and 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 you know punch a clock or anything like that, but like I wanted to inspire the world. Yeah. I wanted people to know that it's people like me out here that's going to keep chasing to be something. I didn't know what I wanted to be, but I knew I wanted to be something. And let me tell you something. Sometimes God sits us down to realize our purpose. Oh, yes. So I yeah. went through all of these years. Um, I got hooked on opiates. Um, I had a really bad addiction. I was taking a lot of pain pills, which I thought was helping me my pain. But my mind was tricking me to need that stuff. Yeah. So... 
Um, shout out to this doctor, man. His name was Bruce R. Heppenstall, um, my older doctor in PA. He gave me one of my last back surgeries, and that really changed my life because I started to understand how to get myself back aligned. Yeah. Because I was walking on a cane um, every day. And uh, how old were you? I'm At the time, I'm like 22 years old. Yeah. So, like, you got to think about it. I'm this 22-year-old kid, 23 years old. I'm relying on um, morphine every day, uh, Percocet, 30 milligrams. I'm taking 100 grams of morphine pills every single day wow. with um, Xanax because of the anxiety. I'm taking antidepressants. My life just feels like a pill at this point. But I don't know this because sometimes when you get addicted to something, you don't understand the addiction because you're in it. You're yeah. living it. So yeah. my family members was concerned about me, you know, my addiction. They, they used to see me falling asleep. I, and, you know, one day I can remember being in Philly. Um, There's a, a, a strip called Westchester Pike. Mm -hmm. And I was on Westchester Pike at the light. And I was at the light for about 20 minutes. Didn't even realize I was asleep. Wow. And I was in a barbershop one day right after that. My barber told me he didn't want to cut my hair anymore because he didn't want anything to happen to me. Because I've always been that kid that actually, I like I like cars. Yeah. So I always, you know, had nice cars and nice things and stuff like that. I worked for it. But they were concerned about me because my city was so dangerous and I wasn't on point in, in, in certain areas and stuff like that because I was on the um, narcotics. But let me tell you, moving to Atlanta in 2014 changed my life because I seen opportunity. I seen kids and I seen families. I seen people that look like me have success and, and, and the wealth that I dreamed of having. But when I came here, I had my own wealth at the time. So like, you know, now I'm like, what's the next thing to do? Because of the personal injury yeah. settlement. So, yeah. yeah, so now I'm looking like, what can I do? I don't. I can't go get a job anymore. I have to make what I have work for the rest of my life. But let me tell you something. I still was hooked on opiates, still partying every day. Blew all of my money that I came here with. But I took my last $200,000 and I put it into my dream. And then one day, I was staying in 7712. That was the first building I ever lived in Atlanta. It was a condo on 12th Street in Midtown. I threw a bag of pills out the window that was in a pillowcase. I told God, I'm done. I'm going to fight it. I sat in my apartment for about a week, suffering in pain. Like, no rehab, no nothing. I'm talking wow. about, like, razors inside my body cutting me open. Like, it felt like somebody was stabbing me because I, I'm, I'm going cold turkey now. I'm getting off of these things. So this is 2014. This is this is about 2014 going on 2015. I'm so now. So how long were you on the opioids? How um, long were for you? about I would say five years strong. Yeah. Um, yeah. so my body just got a you know adjusted and addicted to it. But let me tell you something. I'm not um advocating anybody to to get on marijuana or anything like that. But I had a doctor that I was really close to, and he thought that it would be um kind of smart of me to, to to try marijuana to get off the opiates right mm -hmm. the opiates so um I tried marijuana and I now can cope off of having something in me you know that that's not you know damaging my liver yeah you know having me you know a whole total different person where I'm not Derek Hayes I don't I'm this zombie yeah so I started to slowly get my life back together and that really was my testimony to saying you know this is my downslope. I'm 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 already at the bottom. You know yeah. what now can I lose? I lost my father, I lost my fortune. Wow! But all I got now is my business, and I had a newborn baby, which was with my daughter Dollar. So, my daughter, my business, and me getting over the addiction was my motivation to keep on going. It saved your life. It saved my life. And so you have this life changing moment, and you're like not even thirty years old. No, um, but you know I tell people like. I was the kid that was grown before I was supposed to be grown. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never hung with my age, you know. Yeah. I was probably one of the youngest out of my friends, you know. But, like, even, not even just my friends, like, I would always be around, like, the OGs, the older guys, because I just liked it to learn, you know. Yeah. I always wanted to be around something that motivated me. Money was never my motivation. Success was. Mm. Because my grandfather used to always tell me this, you know. Them guys out in the streets, they only going to have it for a little while, but if you do it right, you'll have it forever. And I can never understand that. And now I'm saying, like, man, let me tell you what life is about. Life is about really grinding and setting the people up that you will never know. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have family that have my last name that I will never meet, but they'll know my legacy and they'll know my story. 
and I'll have grants and scholarships around for kids yeah. through my hard work and giving them opportunity and my family so that they don't have to go to financial aid yeah. and get into debt. By the time they're out of college, they sitting in $300,000 worth of debt and they're getting a $60,000 job. How are you ever going to get out of that if, if, if you don't have an opportunity and a resource? You know, So yeah. I want to be able to be that person that really changed the trajectory of my family. And I'm grinding for my last name. I'm not grinding for Derek. I'm not grinding for just my children. I'm grinding for my children's children's children. I'm yeah. grinding for 300 years of a generation because... I don't know, and I may never know, if I, my family was wealthy before me and they got passed to the wrong hands. But the only way we change that is when you pass it to your kids, if they knew how to pass it to their kids and their kids learn how to pass it to the next generation, that's the only way you can keep the chain going. Yeah. You can look at the Rothschilds. I mean, hundreds of years of, of wealth. Of wealth, yeah. You know, but it's not about, oh, you know, are you a trust fund baby or did you get past this legacy? Because guess what? I can build the engine. You got to keep the gas in the tank. Absolutely. So if you if you're an e driver, <laughs> <laughs> you might run out of gas and we in trouble. You know what I'm saying? So it don't matter how you get your fortune. It's about how you keep it. Yeah, but even for those people who are e drivers, right? Yeah. You said that when you started Big Dave Cheesecake, which is named after your father. Yes. You moved into this. You moved your cheesecake company business into this gas station mm -hmm. in Dunwoody, and you said that that gas station in Dunwoody made you a man. Yes. Because for five and a half years, you were there seven days a week by yourself. Oh, listen, let me tell you, I think, I think I've been on my knees uh, more time in there than I've ever been in church. <laughs> I think I cried in there more times than I ever cried in any house or in the streets because it's like, it's like this. Let me tell you, this guy, this Indian guy who believed in this dream of mine, um, because I'm going to just rewind real fast. When I decided to do this business, nobody would lease me a space. I got all this money, these cars, I, I got titles, and I'm showing people my all of my assets. So I was supposed to get this location, um, and I hope this lady watched this interview. And not to, <laughs> not to throw it back at her, but I want yeah. her to understand, never judge a book by its cover. So I was supposed to get a location in Virginia, Virginia Islands. I think that's the name of it by... Um, yeah, yeah. Amen Park, yep. down there. So, that was the hot spot. You know, when yeah. I moved into Atlanta in 2014, yeah. that was like, if you get a spot there, you you Because it was good. budding. That's when yeah. it was really having a resurgence. Yep. So yeah. um, I gave this lady and her husband all of my assets, and I gave her more than enough. I gave her enough assets that I could have paid for that location for a year up front. And I got right to sign the lease, and she said, me and my husband decided to go another way. Um because of the business experience, you know, we don't want to really take the opportunity, I mean, the chance. Um, so I was kind of down that day because I was kind of telling my family, like, yeah, I'm about to have I'm this, about to get, this location. You know how we do. You know how and, we yeah, do. Yeah, we can't yeah. hold water. It's yeah. on. And you know what? Timing is everything because I'm going to tell you why. I may not have been successful in that location because I couldn't tell a beautiful story. Mm. So sometimes you got to tell it the ugly way for people to know who you are. Yeah. So what happened to me is I go on LoopNet and I see this business that's uh, – Beside a Shell gas station, this empty space that's 1,500 square feet. I'm talking about the probably total gas station is 1,500 square feet. My wow. spot was probably 749 square feet. Um, and I went to this guy. I'll never forget it. I had a cherry red Corvette Stingray at the time. And I pull up. <laughs> and I'm guessing he's just looking at money like, oh, I'm going to get this guy. Now, I, at the time, I don't know nothing about uh rental rental rates i don't know nothing about cam i don't know anything about any of this stuff like so you could take advantage of me all the way around yeah but um he told me he would give me the opportunity and i told him i would pay him six months up front to give me a space that's how bad i wanted wow it. not the other way around getting the build out structure to, to not pay rent while you building it yeah. i don't know any of these things at the time so while i'm building i'm paying wow you see what i'm saying so yeah. when i get this spot open i'm thinking like my grand opening about to be crazy I think it was two people at my grand opening. <laughs> I think I had two people, and the two people might have been the Indian people, and my and the, and the rest was family. I ain't want to count them. So, needless to say, like if you chasing something, you are going to have moments where like you got to be the only one clapping, you got to be the only yeah. one soiling yeah. your, your own flowers. So at that time, I'm soiling myself and not knowing that if I keep fighting, something is on the other side going to come. So when I start this gas station, I go like maybe like. I would say four or five months, I'm not even making $500 a week. Wow. And mom, I love you to death, and I know you was worried about me, but my mother, you know, she was she was worried. You know, 
a lot of people were saying, you know, worried about if I made a, you know, the wrong move or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I never forget that I just kept looking at my dad, just take that last breath, and I just see his eyes open, and I'm just looking at him, yeah. and I never, I can never get seeing my my father deceased in that yeah. last moment. And that was like my my keep on. It's like you working out, you know, your arm and your your body get tired, and you know you got to push yourself to get stronger. So I was pushing myself to get stronger, but what I was doing was never giving up. So I would go in this gas station every day. I'm in there hustling. My first employee, like he was a little little white kid. He probably was um, maybe the ninth grade. Yeah. I couldn't even pay him. <laughs> he winded up dishing out. <laughs> and then. Let me tell you the blessing that came to me. So one of my um, my childhood friends that I went to school with, uh, um, his little brother uh, actually started working at the company. He was a, a chef. And I met a miracle through that relationship. And that was my boy, John, who is my longest employee that I ever hired. I watched John live on my couch to get married. You know, and I watched all these things happen through the business. But needless to say, when I got John, I got Luke, which was his friend. So let me tell you, in my mind, I'm like, I have to get somebody that's going to be able to cook in the business. People will love. And if they're not from Philly, they still going to respect. Mm. So what's better than hiring two big dudes with humor? <laughs> I'm like, we, it's like being the fat boys in the kitchen, you know, so like. And let me tell you, we're 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 in this little kitchen, and we got like maybe like two twenty four inches to twenty five inches of space, so we can't even walk by each other. Wow! I gotta like go like this, and they gotta <laughs> go by me. So like, but let me tell you what's so so good about that moment in that gas station. We learned how to be in each other way, hmm. but we learned how to get around each other. We learned each other. Let me tell you, it's not too many people in this world that I trust more than them two. Yeah, a lot of things that they see. And I tell this, and I share this with them all the time. Don't get tricked out of what you see, who you think I trust, and who I believe in. Y'all are my soldiers. Y'all are my generals. I couldn't have did did this without y'all. Mm. You know, I let, I let them know this. So, along the way of me building this gas station location, Eve came. I I told you when we were off camera. I said <laughs> that story was so yeah. good when I heard you tell that. Yeah, story. Yeah, but now I'm gonna give you a side that I haven't told. Um, so. When I meet, uh, before I meet Eve, my brother's friend, who, um, man, like I could think think this person a million times over because I was at a so bad of a point in my life. I'm stressed out. No money. I don't even want nobody to know I don't have no money yeah. because then I don't want to start getting treated differently. All the people who, you know, that respected me and yeah. I don't want to lose these type of uh, respect in my, in my city. You know, I didn't want to go back to my neighborhood like... You was the one that could have made it out. Like, you the donkey yeah. of the day. Like, I'm yeah. never going to be the same person. <laughs> you didn't want to be the donkey no. of the day. <laughs> I can't, like, you can't blow this type of yeah. money and then, like, yeah. come back and then, like, expect people to, like, really respect it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, like, yeah. right now, my enemy got to respect me now. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Like, my haters got to respect yeah, me now. absolutely. Like, if you don't like me right now, you got a problem with yourself because if you're trying to stop my mission... On helping our young brothers and our sisters out here, like to let them know that it's okay if you can't go to college, yeah. go get a trade. It's okay because you're gonna make it if you never stop chasing your dream. Like you're you're gonna make it. Yeah. Like it may take you 10, 15, 20 years. Like I'm gonna give you an example, right? Um, you look at people like uh, Samuel Jackson, right? Everybody think that Samuel Jackson just became this successor overnight. Um, some of these guys got their biggest roles when they was like 40 years old yeah. and 50 years old. So what about all those years that they was chasing their dreams? Yeah. I mean, look at your father. Yeah. You know, he started out doing, doing stand-up. Comedy, yeah. 27. But now yeah. he's on national TV having a game show. All he's, day. All day. day. I can't yeah. click on a channel without seeing him on there. You know what I'm saying? But, but it's he's in his 60s it's too. Yes, yeah. but it's motivation yeah. and it's not happening overnight. So this is my quote that I like to use. Life is not a track meet. It's a marathon. It's all about how you end, so run your race. Yeah. Your race, because your race is not somebody else's race. I can see you have success every single day, and I can just be chucking and just trying to make it happen, and I can't even pay my employees. And I'm like, God, why is it not happening? Because it's not your time. I didn't teach you how to be a a real human yet. I didn't teach you how to be a vessel. So go back to this moment, because yeah. people got to know that Eve. Yeah, that so let's Eve go story. back. Yeah, you yeah so let's them. go back to this Eve story. So... 
she was supposed to come and I waited for her. I mean, just like we sit in this chair. I'm, I'm like, I'm sitting there all day like, man, when she come, I'm going to blow up because I'm going to make this sandwich so good. And she didn't come. So I go home and my lights is out. Wow. And my lights is out because at the time, my ex who I, I was with, um, I had my, my, my newborn baby, Dallas. I remember I was going to the, to the apartment and I hit the light, right? Mind you. The worst thing you can do, fellas who listening to this, <laughs> is take your lady through trauma. Yeah. Um, because then your hustle is going to be harder because the their stress is going to be on you. Like the money, you know, you you know how to get yourself back together. And I wanted to be that person. So when I hit that light switch, I could have been like, oh, man, I got to pay the light bill. You know what I did? I told a little white lie. I said, I forgot I got an email that the building was getting worked on. So we're gonna get a hotel tonight. <laughs> and I had enough to pay this 150 down the street. <laughs> That's yep. ingenuity. Yes. That's ingenuity. Because I can't have Listen. you driving me crazy when I'm broke too. <laughs> like, so, you know, like, and at that time, and at that time, you know, I'm like, I don't know how I'm gonna get through these things. So I think Eve came on a, a, a Thursday or a Friday. I can't really remember the day, but I can remember the time. It was 2.15 in the afternoon. Wow. And when she pulled up, I knew it was her because I seen like SUVs pulling up. So yeah. I knew it was her. Yeah. So the moment she comes, she says, the people that she with, she's not going to let me, she's not letting them order till she tastes the cheese stick. Yeah. So she wanted the chicken cheese stick, salt, pepper, ketchup, fried onions. I'll never forget it. I was making this sandwich like my life depended on I was talking to myself with my back turned. Like, this is it. You have no money. You better figure it out. When she bit this sandwich, um, she didn't have to say a word to me. I seen in her face that she loved it. Yeah. And I was tickling in my stomach like a little kid on Christmas. I'm like, yes, if I, if I get her to post yeah. it. But let me tell you how real Eve. And, and Eve, you are such a real one. I know you always tell me that my success is my success and I worked hard for it. But let me tell you why I always give her her flowers in every interview I do. Because she didn't have to do that. She didn't have to. She yeah. did not have to do that at the level that she was in life. So let me tell you the exposure she gave me. If anybody don't know, Eve don't live in the United States. Yeah. So when she posts, guess what? The world get to see it because there's another whole country that's paying attention yeah. to yeah. Yeah. the story. Yeah. So yeah. she put it on Facebook. She put it on Instagram. She put it on all her social media platforms. The next day, I had more traffic than I can dream of. You had a line. And I had, had a line. line. And I started yeah. to go up from there. But here's the thing, though. My wife always say this. Um, you got to stay ready. Yeah. Because you never know when your moment is going to happen. You can't be the person pitching a product and don't have it with you. Yeah, yeah. Because then you can't give me the full you. Experience. Yes. Yeah. So what I did was I delivered my product and I gave her just not me on the recipe, but I gave her me from my heart because I wasn't like, talking to her like I had it together. Yeah. I was talking to her like I'm this kid out of West Philly who wanted to really make it. Yeah. This is my dream to make it. Yeah. And let me tell you, she helped me make it because a lot of people are gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are, you know how many people, yeah. men, I have never been around too many men in my life who, who don't envy me, who don't want to see me get to a certain level because it looks like you surpassed them. When we start looking at each other as one, we will win. But I watch people who was bigger than me, who now I have got bigger than. Yeah. But that wasn't my goal. My goal was just to see so you can know who I was as a person. I say you have me effed up. That's what I like to say because everybody wants to be these gatekeepers sometimes. And I'm breaking down gates. You can't keep no gate on me because God is my only gate. Amen. You get what I'm saying to yeah, that? So like amen. when you try to block me out, the women going to come and give me the blessing. So let me tell you when it comes to this black woman. Black women, when they see a black man and they see something in you and they have the power to push you, they will do anything in their power to do that. And that's what she did for me. And I will forever be thankful. And I don't care if I become this billionaire that I hope to become. I will always give her flowers. I always yeah. say that she helped me deposit my success into the universe. Yeah. Yep. I, I love that story because... It was you behind that that grill saying, "I this this cheesesteak is gonna change my life." Yeah, I mean, because like, is gonna change yeah, my because life. I looked at it this way: like, how can you give up 
if you truly respect something, when I mean respect something, honor something, it wasn't a man in this world other than God who I respect more than my father. I could not give it my all. I'm like, yeah. it's going to have to bring me to my knees and take the breath out of my body to quit. Mm-hmm. And when you got somebody like that, you can't defeat them. Yeah. Because I tell entrepreneurs, I tell regulars, like humans every single day who just go out and just try to figure life out. The only thing that's stopping you is you. Yeah. You are your only stop sign. Yeah. Because guess what? I may have you misjudged and the next person give you an opportunity. Then I got to sit back and say, wow, what wow. did I miss? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm trying to figure out like who I am. <laughs> what did I miss? I Absolutely. can't determine who you going to yeah. be. So yeah. sometimes, I mean, look at how many actors and actresses probably then did roles and like could um, the producer could have picked them. Yeah. And then they went on and got an Oscar. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to get my Oscar. <laughs> but I'm going to get it in a different way. You you have a level of perseverance. And this is why I was so excited to talk to you. Because I think the perseverance, the determination that you have in your spirit, this will of never, you know, going to give up. But the driving force being your father, your grandfather, these people, the ancestors who have, like, really been cheering and rooting for you all along. But you tell the story, even when you talk about Eve, about black women, right? That they will support you. And you are married to, yes. y'all Y'all are considered to be a power couple. Yes. This is how you are described. You are married to Pinky Cole, yes. who is the founder and owner, CEO of Slutty Vegan, and multiple franchises yeah. herself. Um, but you said that you and Pinky were married long before the wedding. Man, me and Pinky was married when I was in Philly. Really? Let me tell you why I said that. Because you know how they say God got your story written. Yeah. You have to finish reading. Yeah. So this ain't just happened for me. This was already was set to be. You know, when I met her, I was looking at myself. It was like a shadow that scared me. Like, what is when this? When did you guys meet? Um. So the George Floyd uh, riots, I got my windows broke out. Um. I was like really upset because I'm like, all the stuff I do in the community, how did this happen to me? But let me tell you, before I get there, the same John and Luke, who I'm telling you about, mm-hmm. one day we was in my dining room. And, and their names are John and Luke. Yep, John okay. and Luke. Come on, the gospel. Yep, John and Luke. <laughs> wow, I ain't even picked that. And my dad was David. That's um, it. It's the gospel. Yes. So so yeah. let me tell you, we was in my uh, living room, I mean my dining room downtown, and I had this location open for probably about maybe a few months, close to a year at the time. And me and Pinky, like, you know, I knew her from afar. You know, people were saying she had lines. Like, I had lines. And I remember with Drama one day, um, DJ Drama, I was in the studio. And he was like, I don't know, D, she got, might got bigger lines than you. This is a long <laughs> time ago. And I'm like, nah, nobody got bigger lines than me. And then John and Luke had came and said, yo, man, you need to meet her. Like, y'all the same. Like, y'all, like I don't know her, but, like, looking at her, she's, like, the same person you are, like, on, wow. on Instagram. So I really wasn't paying attention to what they were saying because, like, I'm focused on what I'm focused on, but my windows got broke around. I mean, broke, broke. Um, she came around and, and went in my DM and asked me that I need help, right? So I was like, you know, I don't need no help. Um, but I would like to link with you and see what we can do to help the community. This is during the pandemic. Yes. And she she took me to my first uh, vegan restaurant. It was called Sunflower Cafe. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and when we sat, in, sat there, God rest his soul, my cousin Dame, he was with us. Uh, he got murdered two years ago. Um, he was the only person that knew that I was going to be with Pinky because when I spent this time in this restaurant, first of all, before she walked in the door, she's like, grab the door. <laughs> so I'm like... Who is this girl thinking she like she just demanded me already, but she already had my attention. So while I'm sitting there talking to her at the table, my cousin is hitting my foot. He's trying to give me the cue, like, all right, you dinner over like you ate like an hour ago. So I finally go get back in the car and my cousin will never forget this. He said, That's gonna be a wife. Wow. Um, and was he right? But he was more than right because Pinky, for me, Pinky was that you know how they say that every man needs a good woman? Yeah. Well, I'm a testimony to that because she's like, no matter how she's in her own right or her own success, but if she sees somebody playing with me, like far as like, she'll turn into my manager, my PR agent, she'll turn into (laughs) everything. But you need that sometimes because, you know, you need somebody to care the way that you care. And she cares the way that I care. And 
our relationship is bigger than love because like mm. literally we will put our lives on the limb for other people and like you can't do that with too many other people. Like she ain't the person that like I can say, hey, babe, I I, I decided to give a a, a school twenty or thirty thousand dollars. What do you think about that? Go ahead. I think that's a good cause. Like some people are gonna be like, hey man, you know, we might got a rainy day coming, you know, and like we don't think like that. Of course we're very mindful of how we spend, but we wanna make change. And yeah. and I think like the way we wanna make change is the way we work. We get turned on. I say, um, have you ever seen the movie Going in Sixty Seconds? Mm-hmm. So when they when they was about to steal Eleanor and they sit in the car and they sitting there talking about all the car parts and they start making yeah. out. We could talk about business and feel that way. That's how we didn't wind up with three kids in three, three years. Three under three. <laughs> Bless but, your heart. <laughs> yes, but like that's the blessing of it because guess what she did for me though? She gave me my first son. And my first son came on a day that my father died. Wow. Like the worst wow. day of my life. The worst day wow. of my life. Wow. And I'm going to tell you what happened, how God works for me. My God is stronger than anything that ever comes to me because of this. He seen me struggle on July the 60th, the worst out of the 365 days a year. That was the one day that would pit me back in my old life. And he brung that back to me. But my dad was getting treated at Emory University. My son was born at Emory University. Wow. You get what I'm saying? So like wow. now my Ooh. worst day went to my best day. It's nobody stopping me. I'm I'm ordained to make it. Like I'm yeah. this is my destiny. Yeah. Because I know my path. Yeah. So nobody can trick me out of my spot. Nobody can get in my head. I like to say this word even though it's not a word. Nobody can dismotivate me. <laughs> <laughs> you feel me? That's my word. Nobody can do that because yeah. I already know where I'm going. So when I'm talking to people, I say, listen. You come on to my train or you're going to miss the stop. And you know how many people miss that stop and watching my success right now? It's people that could have invested in me early. It's people that could have gave me interviews earlier. It's people that could have put me in magazines earlier. Yeah. It's people that could have put me in national stories earlier. But I got in them anyway because I was destined to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. You said it's bigger than love. It's bigger than love. What we got is bigger than love. Like, let me tell you, the definition of love don't explain me and Pinky. Mm. It don't. It don't define us. Um, it don't. But you know why? Because lust leads to love. I ain't never lust her. I knew she was the one when I met her. I ain't never lust her. Mm. I already knew that she was the one when I met her. You knew. I knew. The moment knew. she walked I in, I never told lust you to on get her. That I never. I always knew she was the one. Wow. Always. Did she say the same about you? Same. Yeah. And this ain't no cap with us. Like, yeah. ain't this ain't like uh, the cameras on, cameras off type thing. No, we got regular relationships where we don't agree upon. We I ain't saying <laughs> that we ain't regular. Exactly. But the thing upon about us, we know the mission. Yeah. You know, we know the 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 roadmap to get there, and a lot of people get off that roadmap because they watch other people. Yeah. Um, we don't watch other people. We watch we watch ourselves, um, and we grow from that. So the mission, because you have three children under three, yeah. and you have two other cho- older yeah, children. Yeah, five in total. Yeah. yeah, five children in total. And <clears throat> recently you said you sometimes experience father guilt. I mean, it's hard. I mean, to be honest, like, so it's been times that uh, my two oldest daughters, because cause they're in a higher grade, so they have a lot more activities going yeah. on. So um, it might be, you know, Dad, I need you to come to my school play or... You know, Dad, I have I'm having um, something happen at my school, or I want you to come to show and tell. Do you know how hard it is to be booked in another city? Yeah. And you got these things going on where you can't be two places at one time. But I watched the same thing happen with my father and my grandfather because my father was a cement mason, and so was my grandfather. So they would go to other cities. I would see my father on the weekends most of the time. Mm. But when I seen him, we were going places. Same thing with my grandfather. My grandfather has never... Let me tell you something what's special about this man, what I'm about to tell you. My grandfather worked in every city you can possibly think of, right? But he never spent a night out from his wife. Mm. He would make it his duty. Like, if he was working in Virginia, he would drive from Virginia at probably 4 in the afternoon and had to be back in Virginia at 6 in the morning because he always wanted to be side by side with his wife. Wow. So I watch men do that. So yeah. now I'm fighting against it. Like, man, I ain't being the man that they was because they wasn't missing the moments they was there. But guess what? 
they were machines. I'm creating a machine. It's yeah, a difference. You, you know, it's a difference. You know, I'm the only one in my family, you know, that's, you know, created a multi million dollar empire yeah. on paper that been recognized by Forbes, that been recognized by all these different outlets and and, and proven. Yeah. Um, you know, that's different. It's a lot of different pressure. Yeah, because you you've talked about, you know, even pulling away, but you all have a lot of help. Yeah. That help you all. Yeah. You My mother, I mean? she um yeah. she flies in, uh, help us with the kids. Pinky mother helps with the kids. Um the blessing of it is is that my mother and her mother have a relationship outside of me and Pinky. That's we don't really even good. understand their relationship. <laughs> they just got their own relationship, but it was so good because yeah. if we got a force shot to have a relationship, it wouldn't be yeah, official. Yeah. They have their own relationship, they have their own talks, they on the phone having their own everything and we just mind our business with it. Yeah. So it's a blessing. I mean, and that. the fact that you your title is a family man. That's yes. one of the first things that you lead with is you family being a first. family man. I mean, and the fact that you are having your grandmother in your home, I mean, that's that old school love. Yeah, that's I mean, old school. you got to think about it. Um, so, and 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 this is no, I want to make this clear, this is no shot to anybody who has uh, elderly grandparents or elderly parents living in their homes, anything like that. But that wasn't my mission. That yeah. wasn't my dream to ever let my grandmother go to a nursing home or uh, have someone take care of her where she don't feel like she had the family. Yeah. Um, I wanted her to always feel like, no, when I was a kid, you always had my back. Now I'm going to have your back. That was the same thing you said about yeah. your grandfather. It was the same way you said about way. That's the way I was raised. Died. Listen, yeah. there's no turning my back. Let me tell you, sometimes I'm too loyal. Mm. I'm so loyal sometimes that I put myself in situations. But sometimes you got to be so loyal to see that if a person really is that person you think they're supposed to mm. be. Um, it's many people in my life who I have been there and carried them and then I say no or I can't do it and you start to see who they really are. Um, if you ever want somebody to stop asking you for anything, tell them you got a job for them. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned that. You know how many people in my family, yeah. you know, that I wanted to see grow with me, uh, who I had high hopes. But what I realized is in this society that we live in, it's hard to see one person get the flowers. Yeah. Like yeah. right now, look, your father has uh, one of the biggest legacies and uh, I mean, and own rights as a black man has ever seen, right? But it's so many machines behind him who make him who he is. Absolutely. Because he wouldn't be who he is without those machines. Yeah. But guess what? They understand the mission. Yeah. So everybody want to be on Front Street. Let me tell you about being on Front Street. Front Street, you can make minimal mistakes. Front Street, every time I walk outside, I got to be this role model who they think I'm are to be to the people. Yeah. I could be having a bad day. I yeah. have every right to want to curse yeah. now and then. Yeah. I have every right yeah. to want to yeah. run a light or, or yeah. whatever. I'm human. <laughs> yeah. But guess yeah. what? I'm not human. Because the reason why I have to, I say this, is because when you make it to a certain statue in life, the human side of you have to understand that you made your life public. Yeah. Yeah. You opened those doors to the public. Yeah. You open those doors to be the motivation to the people. Yeah. So when you ain't giving those people that motivation they need, don't get mad when they when they don't give it to you. Yeah. That's why every single every single thing that I do, I try to be authentic. Like even when I was building my gas station, when I got, you know, my grill is broke, I'm letting people know, hey guys, I got to figure out money how I am. I'm to pay for my grill today. It's coming though, because I don't want people to misjudge who I am as a person. I wanted to be so authentic with them that. They felt like they was growing a business with me. Yeah. Same thing with my life. I want my kids to feel like they seen their father do these things, but I want you to understand that the only way you're going to have this success is that if you learn it. Yeah. Um, and I'm not going to force my kids into entrepreneurship, but I find it very hard not to want to be an entrepreneur having um, the mother and father, <laughs> that, yeah, you know, absolutely. to be entrepreneurs that we are. Absolutely. So I think with kids, you have to let them just gradually grow into something and not force it on them. But right now, I'm seeing my kids have their own talents, like all of them. So it's a blessing, like all of them. So from this gas station, in, from this gas station, 749 square feet, Yeah, you now have one of the top 10 sandwiches in the world. Yes. And when you competed in this competition, you were at a disadvantage. Again. <laughs> Again. That's my life. <laughs> you were at a major yeah. disadvantage in yeah. this competition. And I'm going to tell you how I was at a disadvantage. Um, and I'm not going to use the color thing at all because we, we people. But 
I was in Orange Beach, Alabama. I can count the black people in my hand who was in this tournament. And this is for the world world sandwich competition. World sandwich competition. Um, and I and I want to be clear when I tell people this story. I was ranked top ten in the world in sandwiches, not cheesesteaks. I mean, any sandwich you could think of. Yeah. So when we come to cheesesteaks, ain't nobody touching. <laughs> period. Don't worry, my team is yeah. already. They, they said it period. before you came. They, yeah, yeah. Period. So uh, <laughs> what happened to me was, I got there and it was a gas barbecue grill and a stove. Right. To make a cheesesteak, you need a flat top. So I'm like, where's the flat top? And I'm asking him, like, well, this is what you got to make it on. So, again, I'm going back to my gas station with limited resources. I've already been through that, so yeah. I ain't panicking. Yeah. See, sometimes you got to go through that rough spot. So yeah. guess what? This was a rough spot, guess what? But I had a pivot. So this time I'm saying, all right, let me go to Walmart and see if I can find a skillet, sit on this gas grill, and I can cook on a plate and make the plate hot. Yeah. So what I did was I went to uh, get this this plate and I put it on top of the gas grill. And I can remember making a Dave's Way. The Dave's Way is the sandwich I dedicated to my father. It has onions, mushrooms, peppers, three cheese. So this is a loaded sandwich. I wanted this sandwich to be like the big guy, like my dad was, right? So I can remember making this sandwich and giving it to the judges. And one of the judges happened to have been Bo Jackson. Um a guy I wore sneakers my whole yeah, childhood. He yeah. had the best Nikes, you yeah, know? So it was like, yeah. I was honored to give him that, right? So after this tournament, to get to the next round, you get it was the top 10 that gets picked. So it's this big arena that I'm in, and I'm sitting here and talking to this lady because I don't think I got a chance in hell of actually <laughs> getting picked in Orange Beach, Alabama. <laughs> Which I've never even heard of. Right. And, and they're having the, world competitions yeah, there. And I'm going to tell you the story on that. So um, my name got called. And the lady was beside me. She said, I think they called you. And I looked up and I seen my face on this big TV screen. And I was sitting there like, wow. So when I get up there, I'm like, did I really win? <laughs> so they put this plaque around me. Um, and I go online and I see the stats. I rank number seven out of top 10 in the world. And the reason why today I'm not saying I'm number one in the world is sound just because I never qualified for the last round because they told me I submitted my recipe too late, which I knew it was, I was going to win it all. That was the cop out. But you know what? I could take that top 10. Sometimes if you don't make it to the last round, yeah. you can still take that. And let me tell you how many rooms that got me in being top 10 in the world in sandwiches because yeah. that drew people in and want to hear the story. I went home with my head held high because when yeah. I got there, I wasn't ranked at all. Yeah. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Wow. And guess what? Let me yeah. tell you this. So... Florida and Alabama is in the middle of Orange Beach, Alabama. So, like, me, between me and you, you could be in Florida and I'm in Alabama. So, they have this bar called Florida Bama. Okay. Right? And the night that I ranked top 10 in the world, it may be two black dudes in this bar. <laughs> but I had the fun of my life because I ranked top 10 in the world. So, let me tell you what that taught me before I got the success. Sometimes it ain't race. It's classism. It's what room can you sit in to get treated the way you think you should have been treated. Yeah. I'm in a room full of different people that's not my race, but I won. So yeah. they treated me how I was supposed to be treated. Yeah. So now when I get in the rooms, you know, I'm not coming in there like the black dude, like, yeah, I'm the only black guy in here. I'm coming in there like, no, I'm a, I'm a man who deserves to be here. Yeah. I'm an entrepreneur who deserves to be here. And I have my right to be here because I have a history in my roller of so why I'm supposed to be here. Yeah. I mean, the history in your roller days, I mean, yeah. you can go back to that gas station with that white lady who told you, yeah. I, I don't need nobody to pump my oh, gas. Oh, I love, listen, I love you that did the homework. <laughs> no, and you know what? You know what's so crazy about that? That story, that story broke my heart, man, because like, I was just giving her a flyer, right? And she was like, get back, get back. Now, watch how, watch, watch how I turn the story around. My brother was shot in 1996, 97. Um, somewhere around that time I remember because I was only about like maybe maybe nine or ten years old my brother was shot at a gas pump wow when my brother um was pumping his gas a guy walked over to him and said can he pump his gas and he acted like he was homeless and he wound up being a robber and he shot my brother and I stayed wow. out that night and I was supposed to not be staying out because my parents used to work overnight so I was around the corner at my friend house and that one time I got caught because when I got home all of these people were on my porch, and I didn't know what was going on. And my dad, I can remember my dad's face saying, where you been at? You know, your brother was shot. And I can remember, like, the breath just went out of my body because when I seen my brother, he had so many tubes in him, he was like a, a car getting worked on. I, I just 
didn't know what was going on. I was too young, but like I didn't really understand it. But I can remember a doctor saying he might not make it. And that moment when that lady told me to get back, I instantly thought of my brother because wow. he told that person to get back. Wow. So I had to grab myself and say, you know what, D? She just don't understand. Yeah. It's not a racial thing. She just don't get it. And when I took that moment to just grasp her and grab myself, that person later on wound up being my biggest Your customer. Biggest, because uh, biggest supporter. Yes, because yeah. her friend actually got pulled into the gas station one day and her kid, the friend kids ran into my store because I had ICES. You had the ice, yeah. And then she had yeah. to go in there and then she wound up meeting me. And do you know what I'm about to tell you? I was told that I was in this woman's will. Wow. And I was told that this lady is no longer here. And I never even went to look where she left me. She didn't have to leave me anything because she taught me a principle of who I am as a person. Yeah. That's all I needed the deposit yeah. was. Sometimes we need someone not to agree with us to be a better person later on. Yeah. Um, and for me, nobody can get under my skin that way because I remember the moments when it said, get back. I don't want you. You can't pump my gas. Now it's, sir, can you sign my autograph or can you take a picture <laughs> with me? Because right. I took those moments and I grasped them and I grew through them. So sometimes we take those hard times and make them better. Yeah. You've done that. I mean, with, I mean, in the aspirations, I mean, you have eight locations of yes. Big Day She Sakes, three of which are in the Mercedes Benz Stadium, yes. which, I mean, I go crazy every game, every event that happens yes. at the stadium. But you have goals of 100 locations yes. worldwide. Yes. And a little birdie was talking <laughs> before we started rolling. Mm -hmm. And you're going to hit that far sooner than you expected. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm blessed to say that uh, my first franchise deal was 10 units. Um, Derek Lewis, former Pepsi uh, president, um, shout out to him. Um but I would have never got that deal if I wasn't from Philly, and I'm going to tell you why. Mm. I was always had that go-getter spirit. So I was at my investor home, um, Richie Lou Dennis. Before he became my investor, I got a uh, welcome to go uh, to his business assembly. So why did... And for those people who don't know, he is the yeah, former the, um, Shea Moisture. Yes, and he's the uh, owner of uh, Essence, Essence Magazine, Essence, Magazines, mm -hmm. Essence Ventures, Essence Festival, yeah. uh, New Voices, Um so while I'm at this gathering, right, I'm with the top probably 50 of the strongest black-owned brands in the country. Um, and I'm sitting there, and I'm inspired by just hearing people's stories about, you know, not just how much they were making, but, like, where they came from. Yeah. And I'm inspired so much. And then this guy started talking. I can remember. He, and he says he's the, his title was the, the Pepsi president, right? I'm born and raised off Pepsi. Cheesesteaks go with Pepsi. Yeah, so it just yeah. was like... Yeah. Yo, <laughs> why I don't got a Pepsi deal? I sell more Pepsi than everybody in the South. And I'm like, either that moment was going to get me kicked out. Yeah. <laughs> or that moment was going to get me understood and heard and respected. And you know what that did? Three, four days later, I believe Derek Lewis was in my location downtown, putting his money where his mouth is, seeing who I was at a person, seeing my operation, wow. seeing the culture of the brand. And I can tell you to fast, for, to fast forward that three years down the line, he retires. My first deal was 10 units in Central Florida with Derek Lewis because I took that jump. But while I took that jump, Derek was taking me and Pinky on HBCU tours, letting us bring our food trucks, letting us do speaking engagements with the digging campaign, yeah. letting people know who we were as people because he came from the bottom. This guy came from just being a regular employee in Pepsi to working himself up to the Pepsi president. He's my type of person. He's yeah. a go-getter. Yeah. I wanted him to be my first yeah. franchisee yeah. because me and him, our relationship got so stronger over the years. So when we made that announcement, I, were really, I was really just sitting in there like, did I just go from having <laughs> this many locations to having 10 more locations, being my first deal, somebody believing in me saying... I'm going to be on the hook for 10 locations because I believe in this brand. Which are not cheap to fund. No, I mean, my, yeah, my, to... my locations are upwards of $700,000 per location, which was a very um, expensive deal that That's he a, took a, yeah. a very big risk on. But I'm going to give you all something today that I haven't shared with the world yet. Um, when I leave here, when I leave this interview um, sometime today, I will be signing... 
five more locations wow. in South Carolina. That's amazing. That will be 15 locations in one month. Uh, and that's unheard of, yeah. being a young black man out of West Philadelphia, no business experience, no opportunity was given to him. Had to go get everything and go run over. Had to tell people, I'm going to turn your no's into yeses. And I'm showing them, hmm. just staying confident in myself, what that looks like. And right now, I don't even know what it looks like because I'm in a dream. And sometimes you don't want to stay stagnant in that dream because your, your vision yeah. is so much bigger. So getting to my 100 right now, I'm going to run that over by April. I, I I mean, the conversation we had, I was like, oh, yeah. my God. I'm going to run it. Hit that. Yeah, I'm going to run it over. Quick. Um. My goal was just not to do the 100 locations. My goal before that was I wanted my kids, when we driving in the car, and you know how you about to get off the exit and you see the blue sign, you see the McDonald's, the Wendy's, the yeah. Chick-fil-A's. Yeah. I want them to see Big Dave's. Wow. And wow. I want them to be like, Dad, there's a location on this stop. Let's go in there and check it out. Let's see if they running the brand the right way. Right. I want to know what that feels like. Yeah. That's my goal. Yeah. I mean, a goal that is... You, I think, and David Shan said this to you in his interview with you. You force people to remove all their excuses. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, I mean, to be honest, I want to tell you the truth. I've been shot at. I've been arrested. I've been in bad situations. I didn't see things with my own two eyes that gave me a permanent um, PTSD. Yeah. I live in a country club now, and I hear noises. I can't go back to sleep. The trauma that I've had, I didn't want for my kids. Yeah. And if I don't want that for my kids, I got to keep on working and working and working yeah. so that I can provide them a better opportunity because the opportunity I was given, they will get swallowed in. You know, a lot of people can't adjust to something like where I come from, but sometimes you don't know how bad it is, what you came from, because you in it. Um, and I look at it like this. Kids that's out there right now in lower income communities, ghettos, or whatever you want to call it, I want them to look at me and say, might not be the the level of when I say this to say I want to put this this level of uh, power on me, but the Malcolms, the Malcolm X's, like we had to pay attention to those things to even get motivated. I just did a, a speaking engagement in Virginia where I just got my own day on Martin Luther King Day. Wow, you get what I'm saying? Like yeah. I didn't yeah. expect that. Yeah. So I don't, I don't. So when people look at me, they look at me a different way. They look at me a different vessel. But I ain't gonna give it to you by the book. I'm going to give it to you real. I'm going to give it to you in a way that you can understand it. I'm not going to be that guy sometimes sitting in a suit and I'm talking so high level and being ignorant to the to the, the group I'm talking to. No, they don't know what I'm talking about just yeah. so I can sound like the better me. Yeah. No, I'm going to give it to you like if you don't get your shit together, you ain't going nowhere. <laughs> if you in your yeah. own way, you're not going yeah. nowhere. Yeah. If you think that you're going to get out of this poverty by not busting your tail, yeah. you're not going nowhere. Yeah. When you wake up in the morning, if you tired of standing on the street corners with your homies and y'all doing the same thing every single day, if you don't want to change that, you not going nowhere. But I'm going to show you how to do it if you pay attention. And that was that's only my goal I got. That's all I got. That's yeah. my biggest goal. My biggest goal, people think, you know, I make millions of dollars now, but once you get used to making millions, it's, it's, it's making millions. It ain't really like the money that drives you anymore. Yeah. You know, when I first made my first million dollars, I was in a gas station. I remember my homie Tox saying, hey, do you hit a million in sales? And that was the only time I ever cared about it. Yeah. You know, I never looked at, you know, going year to year, making two and three million more every year. I never looked at that. I was always looking at, I opened two stores this year. Wow. I opened three stores this year. I got three in the Mercedes-Benz Stadium because I started going, bringing my food truck to to, uh, to their, um, the, the, training, uh, the camp. training camp. Yeah. And every opportunity I have gotten, I had to run my mouth so people would know who <laughs> I am. And I would sit there and tell a billionaire right in front of his face, if you don't take the opportunity now, I see you in the room later on. And I'm going to be sitting at your table, but not through your invite. Mm -hmm. You're going to be through mine. Yeah. Wow. And I don't care how you take that because it's so many people that I have already proven that to. It's so many people who I told that I was going to be bigger than. It's so many people who I told was going to feel bad about not believing in me because God gave me a different type of angel. And that's my father. And he ain't going to never let me down. Amen. Never. Oh, my God. Derek, you have inspired me. I know everybody who listens to this, heck, their heart, their mind is going to be touched by this in such an amazing way. As we close out this interview, one word that you are committed to in this season of your life. If you look on my Instagram, I said, this year is personal. What I mean by that, every flower that was supposed to blossom for me, 
Hmm. Every soil that I dug that was supposed to get that root to come out that soil. Yeah. And every door that closed on me. Yeah. In 2024, I'm knocking it all down. <laughs> this is the year that they will know who Derrick Hayes is. This is the year that any outlet who pits me out will pit me out the right way so that the rest of the world get inspired. I look at myself as the biggest weapon because if I can inspire these kids that's out here doing the wrong thing to do the right thing, oh, that's dangerous. Yeah. That's so dangerous. So dangerous. Yeah. So personal. Yeah, it's personal. This is your season, mm -hmm. Derek Hayes. I am so blessed to just be a part of it. No, and I thank you thank so you. much um, because you could be interviewing anybody else, but you chose to interview me. And um, I just want to personally say thank you. I respect your family. I respect your father. Um, you keep on doing what you're doing because you're going to keep allowing people like me to come share their stories and getting people inspired by it. Because if we ain't sticking in it as a vessel, we'll fall apart and we'll keep disrupt this 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 big, just massive disruption. It's just going to keep happening. Yeah. We're going to keep taking turns saying, I'm going to let you have the power this year. <laughs> I'm going to let you have the power this year. But to be honest, none of us got don't got the power. We don't have ownership. Yeah. So... Ownership, it is personal. It's personal. But it is your season. So yes. I thank you for sitting down with me. Thank you. Vault Empowers Talks, it's been another good one. I am just so blessed to be able to do this. Y'all, thank you for following, but most importantly, subscribe so you don't miss another daily dose of inspiration. Thank you, Derek Hayes, for joining me today. Thank you. It has been my pleasure. Until next time, you guys, eat well, give a damn, move your body every day. Peace. Peace. <laughs>